Welcome, my name is Atre Gupta. I'm a faculty member in the History of Art Department, and I co-direct the South Asia Art Initiative at the Institute for South Asia Studies. The South Asia Art Initiative promotes research-based conversations and collaborations around the arts of South Asia and its diasporas from the ancient period to the present. Alongside a robust roster of talks by artists, art historians, curators, and others invested in South Asia's art ecology, the South Asia Art Initiative also confers two annual awards, the UC Berkeley's South Asia Art and Architecture Dissertation Prize, which is awarded to an outstanding doctoral dissertation on art architecture or visual cultures of South Asia and its diasporas from any discipline in the arts, humanities, or social sciences, and any time period. The second is the UC Berkeley South Asia Artist Prize, awarded for an outstanding body of MFA work. Today's program is part of Crisis in Creativity, Artist Speak series of the South Asia Art Initiative. Born in 2020, during the early months of the pandemic, this series addresses provocative and generative intersections between creative processes and social, cultural, and environmental crises. Speakers in this series have included Alan D'Souza, Alvar Balasubramaniam, Naim Mohiman, Naiza Khan, and Amar Kanwar. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Asma Kazmi, um, who is also my other half in the South Asia Art Initiative. She co-directs the South Asia Art Initiative with me. Her work explores the simultaneous coexistence of the past and the present in the material world that we inhabit. Her process involves long-term engagements with cities, architecture, plants, animals, stones, and other matter to locate vestiges of relations forged by the leg legacies of colonialism and post-colonialism in the present. Combining visual and textual detritus from Western and non-Western historical manuscripts, photographs, archival material, fragments, and mixing them up with her own fabulations, Kazmi tells intertwining stories about Islam, Muslim culture, complex trade routes, the global flow of people and things, labor, colonial and indigenous knowledge systems, and interspecies entanglements. Kazmi was born in Quetta in Pakistan, and she now works between the US, India, Pakistan, China, Europe, and the Middle East. She has exhibited widely, most recently in the Bai City Biennale of architecture, of urbanism and architecture in Shenzhen. Kazmi is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Art Practice, and she's affiliated with the Berkeley Center for New Media at UC Berkeley, and she also co-directs uh, this art initiative with me. Uh, I know we are eagerly waiting to hear from her, um, but a few housekeeping notes before I hand over the virtual podium to her. Um, please note that, you can, that, that audience members are able to submit questions and answers, uh, questions using the Q&A function, and we greatly encourage you to do so. We will have some time um, for an open discussion uh, with the audience uh, at the end of uh, Asma Kazmi's talk. Uh, the audience today also includes uh, students from an art history course, uh, AJ132. Um, and I also en I encourage the students to um, ask their own questions by unmuting themselves and they will have the ability to do so. Um, you can also use the Q&A function to post your questions. With that, I will take up no more time and hand, uh, hand the virtual uh, podium over to Asma. Please join me in giving Asma a very warm welcome. Thank you so much, Atre, for um, that thoughtful introduction. Um, let me um, actually, before I begin, um, I, I just want to thank some people. I want to thank my uh, colleagues and friends here um, at uh, the Institute of South Asia Studies. I want to thank Monis Faruqi, um, also Atri Gupta and Shigata Ray, 
who are my co-conspirators in imagining a vision for um, um, the South Asia Art Initiative. Um, I want to thank um, um, my friend and my department chair, Elan D'Souza, um, who has been a tremendous support um, while I've been here at UC Berkeley. Um, and um, I want to thank uh, Punita Kala and Sanchita Saxena for the support and care that they have shown me over the years um, at this wonderful and important center. So um, what I'm going to do is to share my screen. So give me a moment to do that. Um, so, as Atri mentioned, I am an artist and an educator, um, and I work across media, um, incorporating traditional methods like painting, drawing, sculpture, as well as using um, new media like virtual and augmented reality to create um, my works. Um, what you see in front of you, the image, um, is from a work called Cranes and Cube, which I will speak about in detail, um, which um, is a recreation of the city of Mecca. Um, in my work, I um, combine virtual and material objects um, to explore simultaneity, um, which I think of as a kind of tug. Um, a tug of more than one time, a tug of more than one place, uh, which creates a contrapuntal or a decentered experience of the world. Um, I also want to mention that um, my uh, work is research based. Um, I know a lot of you are students here, and um, you know you might wonder what an artist means when um, they they talk about research. Um, so for me, questions about the world, um, which are often of personal or public significance, um, they become a prompt for an open-ended, a transdisciplinary and immersive investigations, investigation. Um, most academics or scientists are trying to prove a theory um, or test a theory um, with their research. Uh, in contrast, as an artist, I feel like I have the freedom uh, to do research to discover uh, without the needing to prove anything. Um, this allows me a promiscuous, nonlinear approach involving travel, doing scholarly research, field work, uh, making media sketches, conducting interviews, exploring archives, making drawings and becoming a participant observer in spaces that sometimes make me uncomfortable. Um, as uh, Professor uh, Gupta mentioned, I work um, between the US, India, Pakistan, Europe, China, and the Middle East to make works that are legible um, and relevant across culture. Um, I will begin um, by figuring out how I can switch uh, the image. Just give me a second. Okay, there. Um, so I know that um, in um, uh, Professor Gupta's class, um, um, the students have read um, an article uh, which speaks about um, this work that I'm, I'm, I'm gonna begin my presentation with. Um, it's called Palimpsest, and it's from 2017. Um, so as, um, as someone who grew up in Pakistan, a recurring theme in my work includes ideas about Islam and Muslim cultures. Um, in my work, I'm interested in complicating our idea about Islam, not so much by creating ambiguous or orientalizing representations of Islam, um, that might have a sensory appeal, but are decontextualizing and ahistorical, 
um, but rather as an artist, I'm interested in, um, in, in communicating a critical, a self-reflexive, a post-secular, um, a subjectively informed um, representation of Islam. Um, so to this end, my work Palimpsest from 2017, um, um, actually, before I begin, I, I, for those of you who don't know, um, a palimpsest form is um, their ancient manuscripts, which were often written on animal skin or bark. Um, and um, uh, these objects were often erased to be reused um, over time. Um, and uh, sometimes the old text would reappear um, to create uh, an accidental juxtaposition between uh, writings that happened at different times in history. Um, so, so that's the form that inspired these, um, these screen prints and drawings. Um, a few years ago, I spent a summer in, in Paris um, and um, would often encounter the slogan, G Je suis Charlie um, on various walls. Um, and I would often think about what that slogan meant to me as a Muslim woman. Um, many of you know that the uh, Muhammad cartoon controversy, um, it um, uh, propagated simplex simplistic ideas about um, the image of the prophet um, and um, um, and their um, and their relationship to um, to the historic uh, memory of of Muhammad, um, which is um, experienced by a lot of Muslims as a kind of uh, embodiment, a, a habitation um, in the form of um, Sunnah, which is a, a, a way of life that uh, many Muslims follow. Um, so I was thinking about how the image of the prophet is, um, is an active and an embodied act for Muslims that, who, that they perform daily. Um, and so in that context, um, you know, the caricature, uh, caricatures violated um, people's sensibility at the level of, 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 their, of their body. So I reproduced um, the Charlie Hebdo cartoons, which you can see in, in the back there. Um, and then as a performative gesture, I erased these or whitewashed them. Um, and um, I was interested in the idea of erasure because um, it calls attention to what God erased um, and by whom. Um, and over the erased images, I drew historic um, images of Muhammad called from um, various Islamic sources um, by Muslim authors. Um, so here is um, an image of the Charlie Hebdo cartoon um, layered with um, an image of Prophet Muhammad um, from Iran, um, which depicts him as a teacher from the 1600s. Um, and the next image um, is, um, again, the Charlie Hebdo cartoon erased, um, and um, on top of it is um, um, a, an image from a postcard from Algeria from the 1920s. Um, so this work for me is a, is a means to uh, recalled later histories um, and to think about um, intention and authorship in the writing of history. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next piece, uh, which is called Cranes and Cube. Um, and uh, Cranes and Cube, as I mentioned earlier, is a recreation of the city of Mecca. Um, and it portrays um, my own ambivalence um, about the overlaps between religiosity, um, um, the market economy, um, and the social inequality that you can see when you um, go and visit the city of Mecca. 
Um, so the, the research for this work, um, it, it involved two trips to Saudi Arabia in 2017. Um, this is not my image. Um, it's actually a photograph by a Saudi artist, Ahmed Mater. Um, but I think it, it, it helps um, represent what the, the city um, looks like. Um, so um, yeah, so I went to Saudi Arabia twice. Um, and uh, while I was there, I gathered uh, literary, historical, um, as well as familial narratives um, from my own family, um, in, including photo archives um, about the city of Mecca. Um, the research also involved taking um, thousands of photographs um, to, uh, to create a large system of images um, and text um, that, um, that created a record of the city. Um, the inspiration or the, the, the prompt for this project, um, I should mention, came from, um, from certain journalistic images that I saw in, um, in 2015. I don't have those images, I'm not going to show them, uh, but these were images of uh, construction cranes that had fallen um, and killed um, over, over 100 Muslim um, Hajj pilgrims. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was I was really struck by the visual aesthetic of of a construction site, um, and um, and and the specificity of um, of what was happening in in Mecca in Saudi Arabia, um, and so I started creating these drawings, um, um, which uh, which reduce all the topographical features of Mecca. Um, and the drawings are, are they, you know, they, they, they're propositional um, and they're critical. Um, they, um, oops. Um, and these drawings led me to, um, to create this VR piece, um, which again, talks about um, ideas of grandeur and um, idealism in terms of the real estate boom in the Middle East, um, which again is in conflict with, um, with various cycles of, um, of uh, refugeehood, exile, displacement. Um, so in my VR piece, um, um, actually maybe what I'll do is actually play the video and then I'll, I'll speak about um, the, the work. So I hope the sound will work. Um, I will just show a, um, a short one minute clip of this piece and then I'll speak about it. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله Sorry about my dog barking. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Okay. Um, so in this work, as I mentioned, it's a VR piece. Um, so you have to 
put on a headset um, and you, you become um, Im immersed in my version of uh, Mecca, uh, which is, is um, layered like a palimpsest. Um, and um, in, in this layering, you, you can see the past um, and the present um, of the city. Um, you can see the large black cube, which uh, represents the Kaaba, which is a pre-Islamic structure that was assimilated by Muslims as the holiest site in Islam. Um, and then my version of the Kaaba is surrounded by a forest of um, hand-drawn construction cranes, which you saw animated. Um, in addition, you see um, um, strange surrealist sculptures um, that um, are made up of mismatched architectural forms, um, creating these curious and hybrid monuments, um, showing heavy ornamentation and ostentatious uh, moments in architectural design. So by inserting the viewer in this exaggerated space, I want them to reflect on the power dynamics that are at play um, in, in these locations that are changing dramatically. Um, like some of my other works, you can see on the side here um, in a blurry way, there was, um, there was some poetic text um, that um, I used to talk about um, ideas about the piece. Um, um, I'm not able to talk about social exclusion, um, about the migrant laborers um, that are present in the city from Africa and South Asia, um, living in, um, in tents and temporary forms of, um, of shelter. Um, I also want to point out before I move on to the next piece that you know the industry model of using VR um, entails creating um, really entertaining, fully immersive, sellable environment. Um, I'm using the medium very differently. I'm interested in creating a liminal space um, where the viewer has an awareness of their body um, in the space of the gallery and in the virtual realm. Um, and I accomplish that by making images that um, fall short. Um, these images have glitches, um, they show a kind of visual detritus. Um, and so this helps the viewer critically reflect on the subject um, that is before them. Um, I'm going to move on to talk about another, um, oh, here's another image from um, when this piece was installed um, at the Institute of Contemporary Art um, in San Jose. Um, so the next piece, um, it, it actually grew out of um, Cranes and Cube. Um, this one is called Building the City of Exiles in 2018. Um, and um, that year I received a commission from the San Francisco Arts Commission to create um, an artwork reflecting on the sanctuary city status of San Francisco. Um, for this occasion, I, I created an installation um, with VR and sculptural elements. Um, and for this piece, I wanted to reflect on intersecting ideas um, to um, consider San, San Francisco's sanctuary city ordinance alongside Haram, um, which is a concept in Islamic urban planning. Um, so a Haram is a place uh, that is uh, designated for ritualized behavior. Um, a haram is an Islamic sanctuary city um, where people are supposed to settle conflicts in a peaceful manner. There's a ban on bloodshed, on animal slaughter, um, the uprooting of trees. Makkah, the city that you just saw um, in, in my VR version, um, which is again the holiest place in Islam is, is a sanctuary city or a historical sanctuary city. Um, yet in both places in Mecca and in uh, San Francisco, um, you can see um, similar trajectories at play. Um, in both 
spaces, um, you see that the city is beholden to the aspirations of builders and planners. Um, the skylines of both cities are littered with construction cranes, um, and both have populations that are struggling to keep up with the radically changing um, city. Um, um, and both cities have um, suffered tremendous environmental degradation. So to illustrate these connections, um, I, um, I use VR in building the city of exile. Um, uh, you know, again, not as a novelty medium, but as a carrier of the conceptual content of the work. Um, in this work, you see San Francisco, which is, um, which is represented as a littered datascape um, made up of, um, again, composite architectural forms using a method called photogrammetry. Um, where I went to um, various um, homeless encampment sites um, and documented them. Um, and like my version of Mecca, um, in this piece too, you're surrounded by a forest of hand-drawn construction cranes, as well as fog. Um, so again, um, in this piece, the hybrid VR city um, is experienced at the threshold um, of sleeping and waking, it functions as a nostalgic memory, um, a ghostly after image of other places. Um, and um, the city, um, you know, uh, uh, um, immerses the viewer um, in these kinds of oral, visual, and haptic relations where you're surrounded by virtual artifacts, um, copied and pasted 3D objects, um, and sounds. Um, so in this way, the viewer is put in, in uncomfortably close proximity to the shelter and encampment structures in, in San Francisco, um, which as we all know, are built by um, a, 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 a drifting, um, but marginalized community um, of, of refugees, exiles, immigrants, um, disabled people. So um, the relations between the virtual um, are, and the real are made legible in this work by, um, by the use of sound. Um, again, I use some poetic text um, that talk about uh, five-star hotels, um, sleek computer-generated advertisement, um, selling shiny steel and cords apartments. Um, so the viewer is uh, put in a kind of paradoxical relationship with the visuals. Um, and it creates an opportunity for the viewer to have an embodied understanding um, of the links between the market economy um, and the marginalized people and spaces in the city. Um, for the next piece, I'm going to go back to Mecca. Um, and this piece was made at the same time as Cranes and Cube. Um, this piece is called Indian Mangoes by the Red Sea um, uh, from 2017. It's a three channel video. Um, and for this work, I followed the trajectory of the Indian mango to the shores of the Red Sea in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Um, the mango in this piece represents a traded fruit, a diplomatic vessel, um, and it functions as a symbolic surrogate for the Hajj uh, pilgrims that arrive um, at the port of the Red Sea. Um, the video, as you can tell, I'm not going to play the, the video. Um, um, I will just um, show the still image from it. Uh, but it's shot at three different locations um, by the port, um, which allows the viewer to sort of understand that landscape. Um, so what you see is um, um, me um, uh, pictured in front of a crumbling neighborhood. Um, which in Jeddah, which was um, first established in the seventh century. 
Um, in the other um, clip, you see a polluted port. Um, and um, in the middle, you see um, this kind of um, generic yet orientalist design, um, new fountain that was built um, as a kind of symbol of the modernization and greening um, of the city. Um, you see three burqa clad women, um, that's me and two of my graduate students. Um, and we're eating the Indian mango in the manner of the South Asian pilgrims by softening the mango in our palms and sucking at the liquefied mango flesh. Um, in the birthplace of Islam, the women perform a secular ritual of eating the mango and they function as uh, teachers of, um, of knowledge um, about eating the fruit. Um, in this piece too, there's scroll scrolling text, um, which, um, um, which talks about, um, and it describes Persian Gulf urbanization, uh, which is seen in the aesthetics, architecture, and the environment of Jeddah. Um, I will move on to the next piece now. Um, so from 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 Saudi Arabia, we're gonna um, we're gonna move go to southern Spain, um, and um, this next piece is called "After the Minaret" from 2019. Um, I was invited by the University of Sevilla um, to create an artwork for their gallery, and so for this prompt, I created a site specific installation about the most uh, prominent architectural site in Sevilla, um, uh, which is called the Geralda. Um, and this project engaged with the history um, of reproduction, preservation, and change in form and in use um, to the Geralda Tower. Um, Actually, let me see. Okay, um, so the just a brief history. This is not uh, Sevilla, Spain. Some of you might recognize this as Kansas City, um, but just a little bit of history about the Geralda. The Geralda was built as a minaret um, for an Ottoman mosque in 1184, um, but it soon became a bell tower for a Catholic Catholic cathedral um, as the political um, power in Spain, it changed in Spain. Um, uh, so the, the function of the tower was reimagined based on the religious affinities of the people in power. Um, it, it's, its form um, also went through changes in, in really big and massive, but also in minute ways. Um, these changes happened in um, geological as well as human time. Um, the formal changes um, were influenced by the many architects and engineers who created replicas and close copies of the minaret around Europe and the United States. Um, there are many structures in the US that are inspired by the Geralda. Um, this um, replica of, of it in Kansas City um, the ferry building in San Francisco is inspired by the Geralda, um, and um, the second, um, the the tower of the second Madison Garden in New York City, to name um, just a few. So uh, let's see, do I have some of those? Okay, here's the ferry building. So my project um, after the minaret was made up of layered screen prints. Um, which showed the many different iterations of the Geralda. Um, and they were um, uh, placed on top of each other on um, translucent um, mylar. Um, so you could see through the layers. Um, and um, juxtaposed with the screen prints were um, macro uh, or very close up photographs of lichen um, that are growing on the Geralda. Um, um, so um, let's see if I can show. So here's his here's lichen, um, 
um, some of you may know that lichen are um, these plant forms that are made up of algae and fungi, um, and they grow on stones and architectural forms, um, and they can have a lifespan span of thousands of years. Um, so I actually just want to go back to the, an image of the installation. Um, so, so in this project, I am um, um, I'm, I'm theorizing the historical, political, formal, and structural changes to the Geralda in two ways. Um, so the project shows a complex connectivity, or um, some people might call it a globalization, where the particular Andalusian architectural form of the Geralda gets entangled and absorbed in a universal or more modernist form and loses its specificity, which is perpetuated by humans. Um, my screen prints show the changes to, 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 to and imitations to the Islamic architectural form by contemp contemporaneously layering the minarets from Sevilla, Madrid, Miami, Kansas City, Chicago, and San Francisco. The second agent of change is the non-human lichen, which has, have lived on the minaret for thousands of years. The lichen that I, um, or for 800 years, the minaret isn't that old. Um, the lichen that I photographed for this project um, are composite bodies of fungus and algae, um, and the abrading of the lichen follow geologic time. So they eat away at the surface of the stone and change the minaret in microscopic ways. Hence the lichen reclaim and renew the minaret while preserving the past with poetic irony by slowly embracing change. So this project invites the viewer to think about history from a non-human and material perspective by re recruiting lichen as historian and witness, the project engenders ideas about cultural exchange, appropriation, and translation as a multi-directional process made up of contact zones of dominance and um, more positively of progress and acculturation. So uh, I'm going to skip through some slides because um, I've already spoken about these. Um, and then for the next work, I'm going to jump back um, to the mango. You'll notice that in my work, um, many of the themes um, are, are repetitive um, and um, come back in, in, in various forms. Um, so I've made many works about the Indian mango. Um, and fruit from elsewhere from 2020 is, is one um, iteration of that. Um, so fruit um, in this project, I weave historical narratives uh, with my own fabulation um, to speak about my longing for the Indian mango, um, but also about the history of the color um, Indian yellow pigment. Um, so just to um, just to talk a little bit about that history of the pigment, um, in um, uh, let's see. So I learned that in the seventeenth um, to the nineteenth century, um, the Western palette coveted the color Indian yellow, um, which was made from Indian mangoes. Um, the practice of making this color is obsolete now. Um, but um, there are many um, hearsay, but also scientific reports about how this color was produced. Um, so it was made by uh, force feeding India mango leaves to cows um, and then collecting that urine and um, thickening it to form um, pigment balls, um, which had a really foul smell. Um, um, and uh, these 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 pigment balls, uh, the primary market for uh, for this organic pigment um, was British and German artists. Um, this was a, a color that was praised 
for um, being able to depict the subtleties of skin color um, and um, was mostly used to represent um, non-white subjects um, by uh, British and German artists. So um, what you see here um, is my installation. Um, the spheres um, that you see in front of you, they're represented, uh, they, they represent the, um, the balls that were traded um, from South Asia um, to, to Europe. Um, mine are made with imitation Indian yellow pigment. Um, it, you can't find um, the actual pigment anymore except for in museums um, and in archives. Um, and there, my uh, pigment balls are placed on, um, um, God, what are these called? Um, shipping pallets. Um, and um, they're, they're, um, and they're set up like a, almost a map, if you look at them from above, uh, looking down, uh, pointing to the global circuits of trade. Um, so here's a detail of the pigment balls. Oh, and um, here's an image of the balls um, from the um, Harvard pigment um, collection. Um, and there are paintings uh, that are part of this installation, um, which depict entanglements of historical representations um, with my own images. Um, so you see um, images of sickly cows, botanical illustrations um, from colonial India, um, stylized representations of the mango tree um, from uh, miniature, South Asian miniature painting. Um, and the self-portrait of me holding up the, a mango in my palm um, in a pose that I borrow from the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. Um, I will speak more about this pose in the next piece, um, so I'll, I'll keep you hanging just for a minute. Um, but I just want to close off this piece by, uh, by talking about the last element of this piece, which was a video. Um, again, the, um, the um, background of this video is uh, the color Indian yellow. Um, and um, there's text, poetic text that narrates the story of the color Indian yellow of empire and my own entanglement um, within these systems. Okay. So, if I promise, I will speak about that place. Um, so the Mughal Emperor Jahangir, um, who lived from 1569 to 1627, um, he was given the, uh, I'm just check checking the time. Um, he was given the name World Caesar for his preoccupation with collecting. Um, he was a naturalist who enthusiastically um, acquired plants, animals, minerals, and oddities from different parts of the world. Um, and he commissioned um, artists to, um, to represent them. Um, here's a self-portrait of me on the right um, and a, 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 a portrait of Jahangir um, as the world Caesar um, in his palm, he's holding up the globe. Um, this, uh, this painting um, actually is, is um, it, uh, very unlike um, the uh, Mughal miniature paintings. This is, it's almost, the size, it's a, a, almost the size of um, the, the Mughal emperor. So it's, it's not a miniature painting. Um, so, as I said, I've been fascinated by this gesture. Um, and um, I will now talk about my project after Jahangir, uh, which was built around um, this, this gesture. Um, so this, you know, this pose to me reads, um, as a kind of embodied enchantment with the material world. Um, I've, been, I've been thinking about, um, you know, why the Mughals um, um, held objects in their palm like this. Um, you know, what, what, um, what kind of scientist does that? Uh, what kind of scientist 
so intimately poses with the object of their study in this way. Um, you know, what did Jahangir see or feel or smell um, as he held up these objects? Um, and uh, what do these poses reveal about Jahangir's firsthand mediated and imagined experiences with matter? Um, so these questions led me to a photographic drawing um, and sculptural installation called um, After Jahangir um, in um, April of last year. I, um, I led a workshop with some students in, at Habib University in Karachi um, where um, I, um, I, 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 um, I presented um, this gesture to them. Um, we talked about um, this uh, tradition um, in Mughal miniature painting. Um, and I asked these students to make lists of um, all of the objects in their personal possession and bring some of these objects um, to the workshop where we posed um, with them um, in the tradition of Jahangir. Um, so um, in addition, you'll notice that um, um, there, there are these um, objects or these framing devices um, that um, are used in the background. Um, they're, they were painted um, by um, a, an artist in Pakistan and they're, um, they're, they're used as these kind of um, architectural dioramas um, 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 that frame, frame this, this practice. Um, so in this project, um, so here's a um, from um, and the installation shot for when this work was shown um, late last year. Um, and um, um, through this project, I am interested in imagining new and unique possibilities about thinking about matter, materiality, and the ecology as we reflect upon um, the similarities and dissimilarities uh, of object acquisition um, from different places. Um, so these sculptural objects that you see in front of the photographs from Pakistan, um, they're inspired by um, a rahil um, or Islamic book holders. Um, and uh, the rahils that I made, they're holding uh, drawings that are made of ink, watercolor, and imitation gold leaf. Um, and uh, the, these, these drawings are made to represent Mughal manuscripts and each one contains a single image of a mass produced object surrounded by gold leaf. I apologize, I don't have a detailed shot of these, but I think you can vaguely tell there's a hand sanitizer, for instance, um, in the rail that's placed um, all the way at the left side. Um, so, um, so the, the apparatus um, that I show um, in this insta installation, um, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in using it as a display device um, and a non-Western apparatus to invite the viewer to think about the, the many intellectual artistic um, uh, traditions, um, the, the kind of ancestor technologies that people used um, during colonial and pre-colonial times to express their cultural, historical, scientific, and conceptual uh, frameworks. Um, I'm also interested in, in establishing a non-Western reading practice um, in art making and in museums and galleries. Um, so what these Rahil do, they, they invite the viewer to bend down, uh, to look close um, at these objects um, in a way that, uh, or these images, um, in a way that um, we're, we're not used to um, encountering paintings in, um, in a Western um, art gallery. Just to summarize, um, 
the, the Jahangir's portraits, they represent an ancient non-Western and Islamic form of ecological, spatial, and material awareness. Um, this awareness, I would like to point out, was complicated um, because it was patriarchal, it was a show of power. Um, in my re-performing of this gesture, um, I am embodying um, an eco-feminist critique, an intervention, um, an act of reading backward Mughal dynastic projections of power um, in an attempt to reform an alliance with um, objects um, rather than just depicting them as property. Um, may I check in with, um, with Atri about time? Um, should I stop um, here? Or how, how we're we're good on time. So if, if you want to, you could you could take take more. Okay, because I I have I think two more works um, that I can. Talk about. Is that okay? Okay, so I will move on to the next work. Oh, here's um, an image of um, the Rahel. Um, that's being, um, that's um, holding a Quran um, and someone sitting down on the ground reading it. Um, and here's another shot from that installation. Okay, so we'll now move on to talk about yet another piece about the Indian mango. This one is called Urban Forest from 2001. Um, and um, this is, um, a uh, new media art project. Um, and the aim of this project is to trouble our ideas about urbanism and nature uh, by creating a fictional human nature encounter in the form of a large scale metal and augmented reality sculpture. Um, the augmented reality sculpture visualizes a contradictory and unusual juxtaposition um, of bamboo construction scaffolding wrapped around mango trees. So what you see in front of you is our, um, in, in Shenzhen, China, um, at a sculpture garden, um, you see um, 10 feet tall Indian mango trees um, that are inspired by, um, this painting um, um, and um, here's a detail of those trees. So just a little bit of uh, background. So um, mango trees are, are, are really abundant in Southern China. Um, it's also the second largest producer of um, an exporter of mangoes. Um, there, um, there's a diverse variety of, um, of the fruit that are um, grown in this region, um, including the Mangafera indica, which is native to India, as well as, um, um, as, well as other ornamental trees in, um, in Shenzhen, uh, lining the uh, roads and cor highway corridors. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned, the stylized form of the tree in the sculpture is borrowed from um, an Indian miniature painting from the 1700s. Uh, the appropriation of this Indian tree structure in Shenzhen speaks about relations between distant lands through the global movement of food, material, and knowledge. By looking at the history of the mango tree, we can learn something about entangled human and plant histories. Um, the way the work works um, is that you, um, let's see, um, you encounter, um, I don't know if you can see my um, cursor here, but um, you encounter a QR code um, that you can um, activate on your phone. Um, and when you do that, um, an animation um, of um, this um, construction scaffolding going up around the trees um, 
um, um, gets triggered. Um, so in real time with the viewer's personal device, the viewer sees the sculpture transform as the mango tree gets enwrapped in virtual scaffolding, reminding us of different and conflicting realities that exist simultaneously within our cities. I think, uh, let's see. So um, I, I just wanna take some time now to briefly talk about a work that um, is, um, it, it has not yet been made. Um, so I will, I will just talk about the idea and um, show some images from um, my studio. So beyond the seas blue um, is, um, is an ambitious large scale installation that I'm working on. Um, this project combines my two interests um, of thinking about ancient uh, techniques um, and combining them with new media. Um, this work combines mortars and pestles, stones, painting, um, non-Western display devices, um, and virtual reality to tell the color, uh, the story of the color blue. Um, so the piece um, here, um, just again, to give a little bit of background, um, uh, the inspiration for the work um, started by thinking about um, the Sarasang mine, uh, which is in remote Afghanistan, um, which was the single source of the stone lapis um, as far back as 700 BC. Um, the trade of the stone um, stretching from Africa to Eurasia not only enabled the movement of material, but it also spread knowledge about uses, um, about various processes um, that um, um, had to be used to extract um, the, the color blue from the stone. Um, and the, the stone also gave substance to our understanding of the color blue um, or, um, uh, because in Western languages, um, uh, shades, various shades of blue um, were, were indistinguishable um, or, or in language in how we referred to them. Um, they, they were um, indistinguishable from various shades of green and yellow. Um, so our understanding of, of the color blue um, was, um, was uh, formed by the stone and the movement of the stone from Afghanistan. Um, so, so far, um, the progress that I've made um, in this work is that I have extracted um, this kind of luminous ultramarine blue pigment um, from the stone lapis, um, which is a really involved process. Um, and the next, um, the next, uh, um, iteration or the next um, process in, in this project involves um, creating um, a, in VR um, an animation or a vis visualization of the remote lapis quarry in Badakhshan, Afghanistan, um, which as uh, some of you know is a contested and politically fraught location. Um, so in this VR work, and I'm, I apologize, I don't have, you, you just have to imagine this in your head. Um, I will um, recreate the, this, this mine um, and also utilize text and sound um, as well as other kinds of visual, visuals um, to, um, to, to show the material discursive and historical origins of the work. Um, in addition, um, I'm creating a series of paintings um, of celestial skies uh, with the ultramarine pigment um, that I'm going to extract or that I have extracted. Um, these paintings are going to be copies of, um, um, of paintings in various collections, uh, Renaissance paintings in um, various um, European museums. Um, so I will spend the summer studying those works and reproducing them. Um, 
And um, finally, these, um, um, these paintings and the VR uh, will be displayed simultaneously. Um, and the paintings will be shown again on the X-shaped book holders or rehels that I showed. Um, and um, the rehels will allow the viewer to sit down in front of the work or bend down um, to read the minute mineral flares um, that you can see on the surface of the painting, uh, which come from the, um, the pigment um, that I extract. So um, I will end my talk here. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, that was a lot of work. It was actually all the work that I've created uh, while I've been here at UC Berkeley uh, for the past five years. So um, so thank you so much for, for being here and for listening. Thank you, Asma, for, for walking us through your the last five years of your of your work. Um, it's been fascinating to see, and we already have uh, some questions that have been posted into uh, the chat function uh, by students from who are who are in the in the in this webinar. Um, let me let me also add that we do have some time to for Q and A set aside. So please feel free to um, post your questions using the Q and A function, or if you if you have and if you are um, an H thirty. 132 student, um, you also have the ability to unmute yourself. You can either post it, post your question in Q&A or in the chat um, or unmute yourself to ask your question. Um, and so I'm, I'm not seeing any questions. Am I looking at the wrong place? Um, it's in the chat function in the in, um, so she, so they they're asking about uh, about material um, and color and in a certain sense you work so much with uh, the work of, uh, with the history of uh, pigment uh, but also if you work with its production especially in the last uh, project that you showed us uh, the uh, where you're grinding uh, lapis lazuli uh, so so so. They're, they're essentially asking if, uh, if particular colors, such as Indian yellow or lapis, represent a kind of a historical uh, social status. Are, are these colors, when used in paintings of the time, uh, do, they, do they flag uh, the importance of the, of the person being portrayed or the importance of the importance of the patron. And if I could add to that, um, what do these colors mean to us today, um, especially in, as you use them? Right, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so um, I, I think I'll, I'll start by talking about ultramarine blue, um, which um, it was, um, you know, because of, um, um, the difficulty in in getting the um, the the stone um, it was um, and and the production um, which as I hinted at is um, is a is a pretty involved process um, uh, the the value of that color um, or it, it was just a really expensive color um, more expensive than gold um, and um, many artists um, used it very sparingly in, in, their, in their artworks. Um, so, um, you know, it was often um, used to um, depict um, Mary's um, garb, for instance, um, or, um, you know, other things that represented um, heavenly objects. Um, so again, it was used really sparingly in, um, in in the Re Renaissance painting, for instance, um, and um, and I, I spoke about Indian yellow. Um, it, it you know it was a color that um, was used um, to represent um, non-Western subjects, um, and um, you know and and that was sort of mixed with 
um, the fact that it it smelled so bad. And so the 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 sort of irony of that, the poetic irony of that um, is is not lost on anyone. Um, and uh, let's see what what was the last um, so what do you had a last um, bit um, to add to this? What do the colors mean now? So what kind of discursive work do they do for you? Yeah, for me. Um, well, I mean, I you know, I think for me, I'm I'm interested in um, um, I'm interested in thinking about um, about media um, and mediums and thinking about how um, how new media is informed by um, these ancient ancestor technologies um, that are invisible in in our uh, reception and in, in thinking of um, um, you know things like VR and um, and other kinds of immersive technologies. So you know the use of the Rahel, for instance. I'm I'm interested in creating a, a proximity um, or a different kind of reading practice um, in um, um, in in the reception of the work. Um, and um, yeah, and I. Um, you know, in my work, I'm using um, um, using these two materials specifically, um, the Indian yellow and um, and the lapis, um, to 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 recall these kinds of ancient technologies, um, and uh, and and yeah, and again, how they're sort of implicated in 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 things that we um, use and understand today. And there are two more questions connected to this theme of materiality and pigment. Mm -hmm. um, Alice Jim asks, uh, thank you so much, amazing body of work. Did you say that you will be recreating the mine for your current project? That is the last project that you talked about. And Ophelia Lee asks, what was the material used for your recreation of the Indian yellow balls and the paintings? I'm interested in your thought process of material choice and how you conceptualized and represented the meaning behind the color with contemporary materials. Right. Um, so the two projects, Beyond the Seas Blue and um, Fruit from Elsewhere, they function very differently um, in terms of materiality. Um, Beyond the Seas Blue um, you know, shows or will show um, in detail the laborious process of extracting the pigment whereas fruit from elsewhere is actually made from and made you know invisible in labels around the gallery um, that it's all imitation um, yellow material that I've just bought um, from a, a, a source that sells um, uh, loose pigment. Um, so so you know again the two projects function differently in that um, um, one, um, walks you through a process. Um, it talks about um, the source of the material. Um, it talks about a, a location that's fraught, um, that's inaccessible. Um, I will not be going to the mine uh, to recreate it. So, you know, my challenge is to think about how can I recreate a site uh, without having gone there, um, you know, how can I, how can I construct something from um, journalistic and textual sources? Um, and, you know, and what are the possibilities in that? And what are the limitations in that? Um, I think the project will um, embody that. So, so that's, you know, that's, um, um, I hope that that answers some of the questions about Beyond the Seas Blue. Um, and then, um, um, fruit from elsewhere about the Indian yellow again, you know, it, it, it uses synthetic pigment um, and um, it, it, it talks about um, the, the process um, um, of uh, the pigment extraction, but also talks about um, the, um, the politics around that, right? So the uh, production of that pigment uh, was banned 
um, in India to protect um, certain kinds of sensibilities. The, the cows would get really sick um, in, in eating these mango leaves and would only live for a couple of years. Um, and, and so um, to protect Hindu sensibilities and because um, the process was um, inhumane, um, the British banned the production of the color. So the project builds in this idea that it's, um, you know, it's something that um, that that can't be sourced um, is is um, yeah it, it, that that what what we have now is is just um, chemical imitations um, of of the color. Does does that answer some of the questions? Um, three. Mm -hmm. I know it had many parts. Uh, and could I also ask you about? Uh, a little more about your technique and your and, and your research process. It's it strikes me uh, that you that your works are deeply palimpsestic, uh, in the sense that not only do you draw um, on on the depth of history, uh, but you but in terms of visuality, in some instances you erase, some in instances you bring to the fore that which cannot be seen. Um, and, the, the, and there's this other aspect as well, and that is the aspect of scale. I'm, I'm always struck by how careful your works are, how attentive they are to, to the minutest of details. At the same time, the VR, VR pieces especially um, have this effect of monumentality, in part because one is get, in, in a way getting lost in them. On the other hand, the drawings, especially the ones, ones uh, the, 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 that are part of the Indian Yellow project, um, are, are deep, painstaking. Um, your last project sim similarly involves a deep labor uh, that is of securing um, the pigment and grinding it, which is, which is a kind of labor intensive process. Um, if, you, if you could talk a little about uh, about scale, what what makes one project more appropriate, say, for VR, uh, and another for drawing? Um, and related to that, if you could talk a little about your artistic formation, uh, your training, uh, the way, and your path to VR, as it were. Right. Um, yeah. So. Um, um, I think, yeah, just to speak briefly about training, I, um, um, I, I started my um, artistic career um, in Pakistan, actually working as an apprentice um, to an artist. I, I was a, a, a teenager at this time, um, and um, I would um, make copies of um, paintings by an artist named Azar Zubi. Um, and uh, so, so that's you know that's where I learned, um, and these copies had to be really exact. Um, so I think that that really helped me sort of um, uh, build um, on my 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 technical skills. Um, I also uh, went to art school in Pakistan for a year, but outside of that, um, you know, all all of my training has been at Western um, art institutions. Um, to answer, you know, your question about research, I mean, I, I do want to point out that, um, and I think I, I talked about this during my presentation, that all of my works, um, you know, they, they start with a personal question. Um, they, they're always um, linked to, to me in, 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 a, in a direct or indirect way. Um, and then those questions become a way for me to to dig and um, and search um, and uh, you know again at using the umbrella of art, um, I can take all kinds of artistic liberties um, as I do that. Um, so you know the kinds of activities that that um, that um, go into making these works include um, asking people for their photographs, um, you know, the, the collection of family photographs, um, interviews, um, as well as, um, you know, more traditional um, forms of research. Um, 
um, I, you know, also hinted at, um, at, at, as, at um, drawing as a kind of research practice um, that I, that I use. Um, so, you know, I'm really interested in going to a place um, as a participant observer um, and, and, and really just allowing myself to draw without worrying so much about um, what the work looks like, but really as a way to be present in a place um, and to learn a place. Um, you know, when you draw something, you, you, you commit it to memory in a, in a really productive way. So that's part of my process. Um, the scale of the work uh, or my decisions about how I, you know, cer certain forms are used in the work, um, you know, those, those come after the fact, um, you know, I, I don't start by thinking, um, okay, this work has to be a sculpture. Um, so, you know, as, um, as my knowledge about a subject increases, um, I, 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 you know, I, I realize um, what, what materials I need to, to use or, you know, what form. Um, I, I think my um, journey into VR is very much linked to the fact that I'm here at UC Berkeley with its proximity to Silicon Valley. So at the Berkeley Center for New Media, I remember my first semester teaching here, there were people um, from Microsoft who were um, showing off this new headset that they had created. And, um, you know, I put it on and it just, it, it clicked that, you know, my version of Mecca had to be, had to be immersive. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, there, there are sort of conceptual, um, Mecca is a city that's, that, non-Muslims can't travel to. Um, and even Muslims, you know, their, their limitations um, of travel because it's expensive um, and it's, it's, it's hard on one's body to make that journey. Um, so it, it made sense to, to use VR. Um, um, that, yeah, so I, does that answer your question, Audrey? And in a certain way, you're, you're also uh, quite direct in taking up social critique. Um, and, and and this is also, I think, what Anne Walsh is hinting at. She writes, yours is such a deep and beautiful pr production and such thoughtful research, Asma. I'm struck by the way humor is presented in so much of what you make, even while it's also quite serious. Um, do you think about the effect? Could you think with us about the effect that humor brings to your work? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I I don't think about humor very much. Um, I I always I thought I've I've never thought of myself as a as a as a funny person. But I you know I can see um, I can see where um, some readings of my work um, um, go 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 there. Um, you know I think um, play is something I think about. Um, and, you know, um, play in, in performance and um, play in terms of um, feeling um, um, comfortable um, in, in imagining, um, you know, other kinds of, um, like step in, stepping into different kinds of shoes, um, you know, imagining myself as Jahangir um, and, and, and the, the messiness of that process. Um, so, yeah. So I, I think I, I certainly think about play, and I I, I hope that um, for people who who um, see the work, um, you know, have that sense of um, um, maybe seeing something new or um, encountering um, um, something unexpected, but yeah, humor. I'm, I'm, I'd love to know what people think about about that in terms of my work. Oh, translation. So, and, so Anne elaborates that I think some of the humor comes from the translation across media and time that your work pursues. So, it's, so in the sense, the way in which you use temporal palimpsests, but also geographic ones, uh, that when you bring. Uh, other worlds into into San Francisco, 
face to face with our encampments um, mm -hmm. that we routinely pass. Um, and in, in, in other cards, uh, you transport a different time into a different place. Um, and, and, and I think that's what, that's what Anne is referring to in a way. Right. That makes sense. And alas, we come to our, the end of our time all too quickly. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. It's been fascinating to see and wonderful. Uh, to hear you speak about it. Thank you also. Uh, thanks also to all the um, attendees uh, and audiences. Uh, it's, it's, it's been such a great pleasure. Thank you, Arya. Thank you.